Hello and welcome back to the After Lecture Podcast. My name is Mark Roden, a chemistry lecturer from Yale University Department of Chemistry. And in today's episode of the After Lecture Podcast, we get to talk to our guest lecturer, who is also a longtime friend of mine, Professor James Smith, who teaches food technology in UC Davis. Hi, James, and welcome. Thanks for being here. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Well, I had a good listen. So for our listeners who might be wondering, why is a food technology lecturer talking to chemistry students? Because that's how this class is arranged. I always try to have guest lecturers around the world who are experts in different major. They have given their time to be here to share their knowledge so the classes can be more interesting. It is better to get perspectives from other people around the world. And by doing this, it gives the student a more diverse view of chemistry and how it connects and applies to our everyday lives. That's why this class is highly appreciated by the students. Are you ready, James? Firstly, I want to ask, how's the virtual lecture? I heard that this was your first virtual lecture since the pandemic. Yeah, it's pretty good, actually. I haven't lost my sense of how a virtual lecture goes. Thanks for having helping me with the presentation earlier. You're welcome. Should we dive into our discussion now? Right, bring it on. We may have missed it, but why did you choose to study and teach food technology? Well, coming from a family that is big on food, we had a lot of different family recipes. From our families, the amazingly delicious stuffing during Thanksgiving, to some of the best barbecue ever on 4th of July. Uh, sometimes we even have some curry from a family friend. Gosh, you're going to make me hungry. Yeah, but that's not even the best of it. How why I really wanted to become a food technology was when my family went on a week long camping trip. We tried to bring our own food, and it sparked my interest on how food is actually processed. Well, like how to prevent it from being spoiled, how to package it properly. That's really interesting. So your interest actually began from a real life experience you had. Yeah, and many people actually get it from different places. For some of our college students listening, they may have simply been forced to take a major by their parents, or some of them may follow a friend, or I don't know something else. But I'm sure that some of them have an interesting story to tell. You know what? I'm looking forward to hearing them talk now. Yeah, maybe our students can put that in the comment below so we can read about their stories. Also, to students uh, listening who are high school students right now, they might be able to read it as well and get inspired by it. So, James, you started the lecture saying that there are a lot of connections between food technology or even food in general to chemistry. Can you elaborate more on that? Uh, well, I would say that our students also had to learn chemistry answer the question. <laughs> Not really, but I think that actually answers a lot of things. Well, your students learn deeper on what chemistry is. My students actually learn about food chemistry. Oh, what do they learn in food chemistry? Well, my students learn a lot of different things. One of one example is how the process of caramelization works, like how the flavor and color compounds are created and to the reaction that happens. Or to simple stuff like what chemical compounds make gives food uh, their distinct taste and smell. Not only that, but considering the fact that they also had to take a chemistry course early on, they pretty much learn the same thing just like at a very basic level compared to your students. That's actually pretty interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, actually, everything and anything could be interesting if we just simply switch your point of view on the thing. Like, do you know there are fruit out there that changes a flavor, like a fruit? You may have heard of it, a fruit that changes the uh, taste of fruit from sour to sweet. It's called a miracle berry. Yeah, I think I've heard about it. It was pretty popular, right? Maybe some of our listeners might have even tasted it before. So if you have, share your experience with us. Well, scientifically, it's called the synopsalum dosif. The taste-changing substance is actually miraculous. Naturally, miraculous happens as a tetramol, which is a... Combination of monomers. Yeah, exactly. And those monomers are grouped into dimers, where within each dimer lies some covalent bonds. But I'll let you explain that. So for our non-science friends, covalent bonds in its simplicity are the bonds that happen when two atoms attach to each other by sharing electrons. Yeah, in its most simplest form, food actually consists of atoms, just like everything else. I discovered this interesting berry that we talked about while I was writing my graduate paper, in fact. Why did you choose that as the topic of your graduate paper? 
But that was because I was actually working in a molecular gastronomy lab like, of the chef. Uh, in the test lab, we actually tested whether this uh, fruit will work in an edible bubble just to figure out in a dish. And I edible call it bubble? Yeah, an edible bubble. In molecular gastronomy, they have this method where you make a film around a liquid. They use sodium alginate and calcium chloride for that. So an edible film, like popping boba? Yeah, similar to how popping boba feels, but half the time the spheres are larger. How does that work though? So you take calcium chloride and mix it with water, making a calcium chloride bath with a concentration of like 5% mole per volume. So that means in every one liter of water, there are 5 grams of calcium chloride added. Then by doing some basic stoichiometry, knowing that the MR of calcium chloride is 110.98, we get to know that there is approximately 0.045 mole of calcium chloride in one liter of solution. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, but exactly. Then we uh, then a similar concentration will be used between sodium alginate and the liquid you want to put in the stream. How do you know which concentration of solutions to use? Well, as scientists, we obviously do a lot of trial and error. We would do a sensory evaluation for that to taste the texture and like how it compares in the food. Because depending on what you want to use it for, a different concentration might be needed. Speaking of usage, what is the use of it anyways? Well, the most common way, or at least the most famous way of using the spherification method is by making caviar. Not exactly sturgeon caviar, but they look like caviars. Uh, and when you bite into it, it pops and it gives the food a whole different flavor profile inside your mouth. That technique sounds amazing. Yeah, it is. And in fact, maybe next time when you're visiting California, I could probably make it for you. Yeah, sure. I would love to try some. Also, I guess that's all the time we have for today's podcast. How can the students reach you after today? Well, if the students are still curious, uh, just like what I mentioned last time uh, during the class, they can email me at smith underscore james at ucdavis.edu. Uh, students can also reach me via Instagram. Just look for food with the Smiths. That's Smiths with a Y and an I. And I'll hopefully be able to answer your questions when I have time to. All right. Thank you very much, James. And I hope to see you again soon. We'll see you next time in another episode of the After Lecture Podcast.